So I wanted to give um, an overview talk of PIFR and uh, conscious that Freddie's going to give a talk um, later this afternoon that really covers the technical aspects. So I've decided to go at a sort of slightly higher level and just talk around the sort of history in terms of the, the, the people and the funding and various milestones as to how we've got to where we are with the software. Talk about the, the current feature set and then at the end talk about um, specific ideas for where we want to take the software and perhaps open up that discussion and especially the people from industry on the call if they want to provide any suggestions uh, as to what direction we might want to take the software in to make it useful um, and to meet their needs. So, um, <clears throat> so it wasn't quite sure where to start, but I thought all good CFD stories start with Tony Jameson. So um, I did, I started a postdoc with Tony at Stanford in 2009. And the very first thing he did when I arrived, I think literally before anyone had said anything was he handed me HT Wynn's AIAA conference paper from 2007 on this flux reconstruction method. That's when I was first introduced to the approach. Um, at that same time, GPUs were becoming a hot topic and there were all of these talks of magical 100x, even 1000x speed increases over CPU codes. And more generically, this emergence of um, high availability of flops even on CPUs relative to memory bandwidth and the emergence of, of, of these flops coming in in parallel. Freddie talked a lot about this yesterday in our PIFR tutorial day and I'm sure we'll mention it again this afternoon in his PIFR overview talk. So this is that, that was sort of the scene in 2009. Um, by the end of my postdoc with Tony, to, to, to me at least and I'm sure to, to others as well, the synergies between these flux reconstruction methods and other compact high order schemes such as discontinuous Kulerkin and uh, modern hardware platforms have become very apparent in terms of how the algorithms map well onto this hardware and can actually leverage it effectively. And then this sort of led to, to two questions for me. One was whether this combination of flux reconstruction or similar algorithms with the capabilities of modern hardware could efficiently deliver a scale resolving simulation, so DNS, ILES, LES capability to industry. And the other question I sort of had was how, because the emergence of GPUs and these other hardware platforms had started to make the, the sort of hardware space quite fragmented. There were lots of different languages you had to code in to target different pieces of hardware. We explored this a lot during my postdoc with Tony at Stanford. And I was left thinking whether Python could, at a very high level, but whether Python could help um, tackle this cross-platform piece, so allowing you to write one piece of code to target a range of different hardware platforms. So this is sort of my, the, my first sort of um, learning process around this and, and sort of framing my thoughts. And then in, in, in 20, right at the beginning of 2012, I started my um, faculty position at Imperial College. And really the, the next, I don't know how long it's gonna take, 10 or 15 minutes of the talk, I just want to take you through the point from when I started at Imperial to where we are now in terms of um, developing PIFR, contextualized by the thoughts I've, I've just given up front, with a focus on, on the brilliant team of people who've, who've helped deliver this, um, the, the, the funding sources, which have been important. And sometimes people do, they, they put at the end of their slide deck, but it's never really apparent how that's really integrated in to drive a project forwards. I'm going to mark some of the notable releases, some of the sort of supercomputing milestones where we've gone on to um, bigger and more modern machines, some of the journal papers, and then as, as, as we get into sort of 2017, 2018, 2019, up to the present day, the, the, the um, sort of towards real world industrial use cases are actually being used. And we saw some examples from, from Ginsoc, for example, this morning, where industry have actually taken it up and are using it in-house, um, which, which is obviously great to see from our perspective. So, um, 2012, I had, I had 
two, um, I was funding for two PhD students as part of my startup package and um, hired uh, Freddie Witherden and Anthony Farrington uh, to start the development of what, what became PIFR. Um, Freddie's co-organizing this symposium with me and leads a group at Texas A&M now with a team working on PIFR as well. So he has certainly stuck the course of this project and been there from day one, we'll hear from Freddie later. Um, started writing code from, from nothing, mid 2012. <clears throat> but by early 2013, we had um, viscous compressible Navier-Stokes solver in 3D on hexahedral elements running on order tens of what were sort of state-of-the-art NVIDIA GPUs at the time on a system called Emerald in the UK. So that was one of our sort of main initial milestones. Um, I then received uh, various pieces of funding all at once, and in particular, <clears throat> uh, what's called an EPSRC fellowship. This is like a, an NSF early career award in the US. Um, and that was a five-year grant, which really acted um, ran, running through to 2018. Um, which really acted to underpin all of this work. Without that, I don't think it really could have happened as it's happened. So that was a, a big milestone in terms of the funding. Um, two other PhD students, George Demos and Harry Davis, um, were hired at that point, expanding the team. And by uh, just before Christmas 2013, we had our first public release on GitHub, open sourced under... Um, BSD license, and this was version 0 0.1, which had support for two backends. So we had this um, cross platform support. So a CUDA backend to target NVIDIA GPUs and a C and OpenMP backend to target um, uh, CPUs and quadrilaterals and triangles in 2D, only hexahedra at that point uh, in 3D. Um, then moving on to 2014. We received some more funding from Innovate UK for a project with uh, Zenitech that Mark Allen, who's from Zenitech, mentioned in his slides this morning. Um, the objective there was to try and translate the technology we were working on over into uh, ZCFD, their code base, which Mark was, was presenting earlier today, and, and that was uh, a very successful project. Jin Sok, actually, I'll mention in a second, who also presented this morning, was involved in, in delivering that. Um, also, 2014, Brian Vermeer was hired as a, a postdoc in my group. He now leads a group at Concordia University, and he will be speaking it, um, in a couple of slots time this afternoon about work on our incompressible solver and convergence acceleration. Um, and we had uh, our second release, version 0 0.2, which added a third backend with OpenCL to support AMD GPUs, and then expanded... Uh, the support for element types to tetrahedra and prism. So that was a sort of notable upgrade. Um, Jin Sok was hired in 2014. He, he spoke this morning to work on this hyperflux project. And uh, also hired Arvind Dyer as a, a, another postdoc um, who ended up underpinning a lot of our efforts that were shortlisted for the Gordon Bell Prize in 2016 that I'll mention in a second. And by that point, the end of 2014, we had our first paper out in a journal called Computer Physics Communications, which is a very nice journal for disseminating um, software developments, uh, as well as numerical and sort of physics analysis, but with, with, it has a focus on the software parts, which was nice for disseminating what we've done with PIFR. The, the capabilities described in that paper were from our version 0 0.1 release that came out a, a, about a year earlier. Obviously, the, the peer review process can take a while. Um, moving then into 2015, um, we uh, received funding through uh, an EU project called TILDA, led by uh, Charles Hirsch at Numica, um, looking at advancing, um, basically being able to take LES capabilities to industry and, and, and PIFR, obviously, and the technology in it is a good candidate for doing that. Um, also at that point, Nikki Loppy was hired as a PhD student, uh, co-supported by um, BAE Systems to add uh, an incompressible solver to PIFR. So up to that point, we'd focused on compressible uh, and, and BAE were interested for, for, for submarine simulations, having an incompressible solver. 
And, and the genesis of this actually was Mark who spoke this morning and spoke actually this morning about the challenges of incompressible with, with high order, um, which was very interesting. Uh, uh, then also uh, June 2015 at AIAA Aviation, we had our version one release where the sort of terms of reference for us for that release were that uh, a master's project student, for example, could pick up the software and with some level of supervision, use it for their master's project. So it's not industry ready at that point. And that's sort of our vision for version two, which hasn't come out yet. But version one was that as an academic, academic users could pick it up for restricted sets of use cases and, and it had enough was feature rich enough to support them in that endeavor. Um, by this point, we've advanced up the sort of food chain in terms of using larger supercomputers and we're running on hundreds towards thousands of K20Xs, which were also state of the art at the time on Pisdaint, which is a very nice large cluster um, at CSCS in Switzerland. And uh, a second paper came out on, on the software aspects of PIFR, um, Freddie was the lead author on uh, looking at the heterogeneous computing aspects. So we could now support, we had these three back ends to target NVIDIA GPUs or AMD GPUs or um, Intel CPUs. And we did a bunch of experiments running mixed element meshes partitioned into three partitions, for example, and running each partition on a different piece of hardware because the PIFAR gives us the flexibility to, to do that. So that was a nice um, demonstration in that paper of that capability. By the beginning of 2016, we were up to running on tens of thousands of, of K20X GPUs on Titan at Oak Ridge National Laboratory. In the first instance, testing and scaling, but as you'll see later, to actually run uh, production simulations as well. We had a nice paper come out on, on, on a software called Gimmick, that's now a dependency of PIFR, uh, that handles, uh, as many people will be aware, one of the key sort of core components of, of the flux reconstruction algorithm can be cast as matrix multiplications. Uh, you can do this with, with BLAS libraries supplied by the vendor of the hardware that you're looking to target. But you can also, in some cases, when you know a lot about the matrices, special case these, and this is a library for doing special case matrix multiplies that we use uh, a, a lot now in PIFAR. So that was another paper in computer physics communications. Further funding from the, the Philip Leverhulme Foundation was received in 2016 to support development of our in situ um, visualization and analysis technology that still hasn't gone mainline, although we have a vision to make it mainline soon. Um, but that sort of started off aspects of this in situ analysis work. Yoshiaki joined my group at Imperial at that point, and Yoshiaki will be speaking later about some uh, low pressure turbine blade simulations um, that, that, that the whole team has been doing with PIFR. And he's now has a faculty position at Tohoku University in Japan. And, and then end of 2016, we were uh, shortlisted for the Gordon Bell Prize, um, and presented at Supercomputing. We didn't win, but we were one of the six finalists. And we also received an insight award from the DOE for a very large compute allocation uh, to look at turbo machinery test cases in collaboration with MTU aero engines on um, Titan. And that, that was our, we had a conference paper about the, the Gordon Bell Prize submission. Then start of 2017, Nikki's work sponsored by BA Systems was coming to fruition and we had our first release of an incompressible solver. The incompressible solver in PIFR is based on an artificial compressibility approach with dual time stepping where the inner iterations are still done explicitly because of our desire to try and efficiently target modern hardware platforms, although that does lead to other challenges as Mark alluded to this morning and we have a series of journal papers trying to look at these and Brian will talk about this later this afternoon. Uh, Marius was hired in 2017. Marius Cox, a PhD student in my group, working on this um, in situ visualization and analysis technology for PIFR. And uh, the final paper, oh, I think the penultimate paper I'm mentioning here is uh, not really a software paper, but it was a nice paper we had comparing performance of PIFR versus industry standards of standard tools in general computational physics. And we now, by, you know, by mid 2017, so after, I guess, five years of work, was when, uh, obviously we had test cases that we ran up into this point, but what I would call our first sort of substantial use case that was published in, in AIAA journal came out. And this was uh, undertaken by Jin Sok, 
who, who spoke this morning on the work he's continued to do with PIFR um, when he went back to South Korea. And this was a simulation over a high angle of attack NACA 0021 aerofoil in deep stall. And we got a very nice agreement with the experimental results. You can look up the reference. Um, our insight award for running these turbo machinery simulations was renewed in 2017. And in 2018, this fellowship I had from 2013, running for five years, underpinned everything. It was also renewed for another three years, um, which really allowed to sort of further momentum behind the project. By this point, I should say that Freddie, I think by, well, maybe it was into 2019, Freddie um, started to establish his own research group at Texas A&M at this point. Um, Semi, uh, who's been you've seen, probably seen a lot of on these calls, has helped him organize uh, the, these calls today, was hired in 2018 um, uh, as well, working on uh, implicit time-stepping technology for PIFR that he will talk about this afternoon. And then we move into um, further use cases uh, this is one that John mentioned this morning and in collaboration with, with Pointwise and Steve Carmen, trying to get the for very complicated landing gear geometry, um, some preliminary simulations with PIFR on that to show that we can actually work with these complex geometries. And obviously this is all completely enabled by the technology that John presented that Steve had been, has been and continues to develop at Pointwise. Um, Giorgio was then hired, I think actually just at the beginning of 2019, technically, but here at the end of 2018 uh, as a, a postdoc. And he's been working amongst other things on the turbulent inlet technology for PIFR and also simulations of flow over um, a high rise building that he will talk about this afternoon. Um, Nikki's paper came out. So this is with Nikki Loppy, Freddie, Tony Jameson at Stanford and, and myself on the technology in the incompressible solver. So that was all, all coming to fruition from that original BA systems and EPSRC funding. Um, and the test cases we were undertaking were getting even more substantial and larger under the Insight Award. So there was, this is the turbo machinery test case. And if you zoom in, you can, this is a DNS with tens of billions of degrees of freedom, fifth order accurate in space, running on 5,000 GPUs production runs. Not, not just sort of scaling test cases. And you can zoom in further and look at the, the scales that we're resolving. And you can do quantitative analysis on this to convince yourself that this is doing DNS, Reynolds number 200,000 um, of these flows. Then, um, uh, ran on Summit, um, which was the upgrade to Titan on the V100s there. Uh, Further renewal or, or further funding from the European Commission, again led by Charles Hirsch at Numica International on the Hi-Fi Turb project. Um, the, the objective of this project being to uh, develop improved RANS models and, and PIFAR's role here is to feed in DNS data to that process to help training these models using a machine learning process. Um, sorry, slight problem with Zoom. Um, now this is at this point then in, in 2019, Freddie had started fully to establish his group in Texas A&M hiring Tariq and Will and Lay um, and Tariq and Will will both be speaking. I think Will speaking directly after me this afternoon on work they've been doing. Um, further use cases, looking not beyond just the industrial cases, there's also examples of PIFAR starting to be used for more sort of Fundamental fluids cases as a JFM paper looking at eigenmodes and channel flow that PIFAR was used for. Z and Lionel then um, joined as we're coming up close to the present day. Z is looking at adding multi phase technology to PIFAR, and Lionel's involved in the Hi Fi Turb EU project. Um, and again, even, even more substantial and complicated test cases the DARPA sub off test case coming out of, of Nikki Loppy's work on the incompressible solver, all enabled by Steve Carman and, and Pointwise and, and, and their high order meshing technology. Steve helped make the mesh for this as well with, with Nikki. Um, the building test case that, that, that uh, Giorgio will talk about in collaboration with Arup. And then uh, up to the present day, Lydia, uh, who's just started doing her MSc project in my group at Imperial and has agreed to uh, do a PhD from uh, November onwards, working on uh, PIFR. 
our current release, which was released a month or so ago, version 1.10. And finally, it's not really uh, supercomputing, but uh, as part of the um, process for organizing the PyFR tutorial day yesterday, we worked quite closely with Amazon um, uh, to look at running PyFR on V100 GPUs on AWS instances. That worked incredibly well, and uh, we certainly want to explore this as a way of deploying PyFR going forwards. So that's um, that's really, I, I, as I said, I, I tried to do something other than a sort of technical roadmap. I wanted to more point to the sort of people and, and, and the sort of milestones that have got us to where we are. Where we are is here, so we have a relatively you know, mature solver at this stage, led by um, Freddie's group at, at, at Texas A&M and my group at Imperial College. This is the feature set. So it's compressible and incompressible Navier-Stokes solver, arbitrarily high order accuracy in space on mixed unstructured grids, um, primarily explicit in time. I mean, you, you can run explicit in time. There is implicit, but that's with dual time stepping and the inner iterations there are still themselves explicit. So it's really an explicit solver at that level. Um, Input file formats, we can support GMesh and CGNS and convert into our PyFRM format. Output, we can convert to VTU, parallel VTU for visualization in ParaView. Um, there's no, no subgrid models, there's no turbulence modeling. So it's a code for doing DNS or, or, or if you're under-resolved, ILES. And we have this nice feature set that we've maintained as full feature parity across all of the different hardware that we can support via this runtime code generation approach that we use and Freddie will talk more about later and other in other infrastructure has grown up other than the technical infrastructure there's a quite a sort of comprehensive user guide for getting started on our website a developer guide as well um, a mailing list and, and a community of, of well i guess you, lots of them lots of you guys are on the call of, of people starting to use this outside of our groups and in industry as, as jim socks have mentioned this morning which is very nice so my last slide and then we've got um five minutes hopefully for some questions is just um this is quite these are quite specific things we we, we want to add it's rather than a sort of big vision but these are just directly what are on our roadmap at the moment so in terms of performance improvements we want to look at mixed precision um kernel fusion which is where you've got two pieces of compute that are done one after the other and if you can merge those two functions together to avoid moving data around in memory unnecessarily in terms of the physics, Giorgio uh, will talk about and is working on turbulent inflow conditions, which are important for getting accurate results with a whole bunch of test cases. Z is working on adding a multi-phase capability that he will talk about. And Tariq is working on this um, partially averaged Navier-Stokes. I got that right, Tariq? I hope so. PANS approach, um, which basically gives you a sliding scale between DNS and, and RANS. Um, which could increase, I think, the the um, number of the, the flow regimes within which PyFR could be sort of economically applicable. And we will talk about that later. And then on the numeric side, we, we still have a couple of issues with our implementation of pyramids. I won't go into now, but they need to be fixed. Semi's working on uh, implicit approaches to use near the wall. Um, and we also, we don't have anyone working on this at the moment, but want to try and add an overset grid Capability, so you can have an unstructured grid that PyFar is running on, talking to a background structured grid for the far field, and then finally we have a vision and, and people working on the in situ um, in situ visualization aspect. So this is where instead of having to write all the data to disk, you get PNG images being spat out of the simulation directly from the GPUs in real time that you can make animations from, uh, and also beyond that in in situ technology for identifying flow features on the fly, characterizing different types of vortices, shapes of vortices, uh, statistics of vortices that you get from these very high fidelity DNS simulations to try and maximize the insight uh, that you can get out.